Okay, this is the real one. Hi, Steve Gilmore. This is the Gilmore Gang. We've got uh, an interesting brew today, and uh, we'll start with uh, coming to us from New York, John Borthwick. Hey, Steve. Thanks for joining us. Uh, from uh, Half Moon Bay, Robert Scoble. Welcome, Robert. What's up? <laughs> you got I some, got a new. You got I got a new color for you. You got something in your eye. It looks like you've got pink eye now. Yeah, baby. Okay. Uh, from uh, where are you? San Jose, uh, Kevin Marks. Yes, San Jose. She's very hot today. Ninety-two degrees. Ooh. Come to Half Moon Bay. It's nice and cool. I'm going to Livermore. It's going to be worse. <laughs> and from what? Palo Alto, Keith? Actually, Mountain View, right? The Mountain View, Keith Tier. Welcome, Keith. Thank you. By the way, it isn't what's up, Robert. My kids tell me it's what up. What up? Don't say the S. Or as my three year old says, what the? Because <laughs> he used to add a little four letter word to the end of that, and we uh, figured out how to get him not to say that. So now he just walks around, what the? <laughs> That's what YouTube uh, Minecraft videos do, do to uh, young kids' <laughs> brains now. <laughs> well, when they accidentally set the entire building on fire. Yeah. You've, you've seen that one? No. <laughs> it's, um, it's hilarious and sad at the same time. This guy's talking about how he's built this one house out of wood, and then he says, I've got a fireplace here. And you're like, uh-oh. And the entire building catches fire in front of him while he's doing the screencast. And he's like, ah, oh. Uh, how do I say? Oh, Cause you, you, it's quite hard to back up Minecraft unless you like spend a bit of time at the command line with Java. Yeah, it's it's very hard to uh, separate uh, twelve year old children from Minecraft. Yes, it is. Basically, they fall asleep <laughs> slumped over the keyboard, uh, and then wait up, wake up, demand food, and then go right back to it. Uh, so unless, uh, unless they intersperse it with Clash of Clans. So, so Steve and everybody, uh, uh, so, but, what's, but Steve, what's up with this sorry. Enterprise Love Fest, man? I like Larry, Larry Olson. Yeah, Enterprise is sexy, and, isn't it amazing? And Bomber's loving, or uh, uh, Elson's loving your boss Benioff. I mean, I, what, what's going on here, man? Well, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I can't comment beyond, uh, you know, our spokesperson, which is named Mark Benioff. But, uh, uh, you know, I saw the, or listened to the uh, show and uh, the conference call and uh, saw the transcript. Uh, I don't know if it's publicly available or not, but, uh, you know, the things that uh, Larry Elson had to say were just phenomenal. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's fantastic what uh, an awakening has gone on around the cloud over the last uh, couple of years. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. So... Uh, uh, what what's your take on it, Robert? I you know I guess the billboard wars are over. <laughs> and, what you mean? Because nobody has any gas it. anymore. Well, I got to explain what a billboard war is. Because on Highway 101, there's a series of billboards near Redwood City, uh, where uh, Oracle's headquarters were and Sybase used to be there. And for uh, a decade, there used to be these billboard wars where you'd drive by and Oracle would say something nasty about Sybase, and then Sybase would say something na nasty about Oracle, and somebody else would say something nasty about somebody else. And uh, I guess now everybody's, uh, you know, kissing and happy and partying, and the billboard wars are over. Uh, John Borthwick, you're, uh, uh, what do you think about this, uh, you know, new emphasis on uh, the enterprises? is sexy is not kind of uh kind of strange huh you know i i'm still um i was still thinking actually i, I was barely listening i was still thinking about slaughtering pigs in minecraft <laughs> <laughs> so okay because, you know, well Keith, i guess we Keith don't have much to worry well, about struggling about feeding his kids and i mean my kids you know they 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 find animals and then they spit roast them and they make bacon and stuff so it's just it's just fine yeah, well, you know, add into the uh, slaughtering pigs. Uh, Aaron Levy, CEO of Box, was on stage with Bomber this week at uh, the Microsoft conference. That, that shows how the world's changed. I think what, what's really changed, though, is uh, Oracle's feeling uh, under pressure because of the uh, NoSQL uh, database. Um, I wouldn't call it a revolution, but innovation that's coming along. And they're starting to consolidate and say, oh, okay, the, this war, war is over, the old war is over, and we better consolidate and get along uh, to protect that and protect it against all these new upstarts like MongoDB and, and so forth. 
Uh, John, you're really tied in with the startup world. What what are you? What kinds of databases are the startups picking? I, I bet it's not Oracle. It's, you know, yeah, no, no. I mean, it's uh, the you know the stack that we work off um, is, uh, is most of it is much of it is Mongo. You know, there's Tornado. There's I mean, there's a whole bunch of open source um, tools um, that through, our teams what, that what, our teams use, and and it's just you know, I haven't seen a single company, Robert, in. I, I want to say five years, um, who's come through the door and said that they're building. That's not true. I've seen one or two international ones, right? There's some random companies you get, you know, who come by and see us and they're in another geography and um, they'll still be like, they'll come in and they'll say, well, we're building this one. And, and they'll be using uh, some antiquated um, proprietary um, database or, you know, random stuff. You know, dot net or something random, and we'll be like, "What the hell?" Right. <laughs> something <laughs> random like dot net. Talk talk through the technology stack you're using, and Keith, I'd love to hear what you're using too. Uh, you said Tornado. It, 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 tell us what all these technologies are that you use on the back end that most consumers probably don't know of. Um, but why why are you are you seeing startups use I mean, each I think so. So let me. I'll go through a few of them, but let me just say generally. It's like the, the open source stack just dominates, right? And so yeah. it's, a, um, it's, it's, it's a culture and it's a, it's a, it's a way of working, right, which um, you know, it's been, uh, has, has moved through the entire development system um, and you know, all the way back from Richard Stallman all the way forward to, to Git. And it's, it's a whole cultural difference. And so, you know, the flavors will change over time, right? I mean, on the database side, you know, if you'd asked me four, four, four years ago, you know, the Bitly guys were deep in something called Tokyo Cabinet, huh. um, which, uh, uh, and then, you know, they, and then they switched to Mongo, right? And they got deep into Mongo. So the flavors can change over time. Mongo's an incredible, um, an incredible tool, but the flavors change over time. But this overarching umbrella of, you know, the open source stack is yeah. what you know, I think people need to sort of. That's that's the uh, that's what's changed the world. And what what we do, Robert, is um, at the very bottom of our system, we use uh, DynamoDB, which is Amazon's version of HBase, basically. And uh, and the specific application for that is um, row-based records that go into the hundreds of millions, where you are, in a way, predefining the queries you need your app to support and creating tables that can support those queries without actually having to do a query. It's called a, it's basically a, um, a, a non-relational, uh, highly duplicative of data, but very productive for the app way of storing data. So things like MongoDB are begin beginning to be a hybrid. They're now starting to support both um, uh, HBase or Hadoop-like row-based data to support queries, but at the same time supporting SQL-style databases which are relational, which are good for things like user records and profiles, yeah. uh, things that change a lot and that need relationality. And so a lot of the choice of the tools is based on what it is you want to achieve. Yeah. And it, it isn't no SQL versus SQL uh, in that more simplistic sense because they both have their place but they do very different things and you really can't scale SQL to do the stuff no SQL does. Steve well, is, t is Tashek on this expensive. call? Yeah. No, John is in the middle of uh, Iowa. Driving, uh, it'd driving. be really interesting because I, I have a theory that we're seeing a startup is startupization of the enterprise and what what, what uh, Ellison and, and uh, why everybody's getting along right now in the old school is because they know that the technologies that uh, John and Keith are talking about are coming to the enterprise. They're being adopted by renegades in the enterprise because that's who still is you know picking technologies. And they're uh, consolidating and, and uh, coming out with things to fight that onslaught. 
you know, why, why is Microsoft investing a billion dollars in a data center to do cloud computing? It's to, it's to have an offering to keep people from just switching completely off of its uh, stack over the next 10 years. Right, well, you know, Salesforce doesn't have the problem of uh, having to protect itself from no. this innovation. Yeah. We let it. So, uh, you know, I, I think that what is going on, though, is, is that at an Uber level is that uh, what we're seeing now is uh, the beginning of uh, taking all of these incredible innovations and advancements like the cloud, like social, like, uh, you know, the variety of mobile solutions which are now dominating. And we're starting to actually get them uh, and apply them to actual work that's going on. And, you know, we're, we're consuming, we're digesting this incredible innovation spurt that's been going on. So. Uh, you know, yeah, we can talk about the, the role of open source. Obviously, that's been paramount for uh, many years. And we can talk about the startups. And uh, But, you know, uh, we're seeing, you know, for example, John Borthwick, you just launched a, uh, uh, a DIG client with a, a, with a RSS reader built in. Or, uh, you know, I, I would suggest that it's more of a, a social reader built in but you know, nonetheless uh, this isn't a new technology but it is you and others coming to terms with this incredible architecture that's been built out around social and starting to uh, deliver products that really take advantage of it and give users something to do with it the, the, you know on the conference right. call uh, over and over again both Larry and Mark said that this was, you know, being driven by what customers want. Yeah. They, they see what's going on here. They see the economies of scale that the cloud brings. They, all of this stuff is now, uh, you know, if you don't do it, you're going to get clobbered is basically what's happening. And, yeah. you know, so uh, there's there's plenty of room for uh, people getting into this. And Well, the, the other thing, I, I wrote Mark on Facebook and it said, uh, you know, if I was Mark, I'd be laughing my ass off or behind off, I wrote. Uh, and I, I said, we're really coming to the end of an age of disruption in this week and starting a new age, which is uh, sensors, wearable computers, big data, and the, the uh, continued exponential growth in social and location data. Those five things together are, are causing, I think, innovation in databases to come along because you, you certainly are not right. going to hook that stuff up to an Oracle database, right? Um, and, and I think Salesforce is far better positioned to lead into this next stage because, heck, Mark was 10 years ahead of Larry and Bomber. 10? It, it, yeah. So, Robert, do yeah. you think... What, uh, didn't, 15, didn't, 14? Didn't Salesforce start talking about the cloud like 10 years ago? Salesforce think, has been on the cloud since day one. Right, and how old is Salesforce? Uh, 12 13, years? 13, 14 years. 14, 15 years? Yeah, that's years? why, I, you know. The, All the, right, so 15 years, and let's before say that, 12 years you know, ahead, you know, because whatever. It, it's a long ass way ahead, and I think... Uh, Salesforce is pretty well positioned out of all those big enterprise companies to lead us into the future because they have such a, a much better view of they're closer to the customer I think you know yeah I would I would add one thing or I'd counter with one thing Robert which I think yeah. is is that you know when you've been a renegade for a long time and I think Salesforce has been an incredible leader um, through this period of the cloud um, you know, one of the things that's interesting about our business is the whole world can change overnight. Yeah. And when it changes, you're no longer, you're now the incumbent and you have to start, you, you, strategy needs to change because you're no longer in the business of convincing people that it's the cloud. Now the cloud becomes the utility on top of which everything's built and it's, it's sort of you need to move up a few levels. And so, just listening to you guys, it seems like on the enterprise side, and this week I've had a busy week and I haven't watched much of what's going on. I heard a little bit of chat about it, but it seems like one of those, we've gone through maybe one of those changes. We'll probably see in hindsight if it was that. And if so, you know, Salesforce and everybody's going to have to learn how to adapt because, um, you know, being, being the guy on the edge saying the world's changing, the world's changing, suddenly you find yourself center stage in the changed world and you've got to act differently. So to me, that's key. What John just said is key. Um, the, the, t the clouds are constant, but it doesn't constantly do the same thing during the last 15 years. 
And I think the primary place to look for change is how the cloud is consumed. And up until very recently, the only answer was through a browser, which consumed an app. And obviously the Salesforce uh, presentation layer has been a browser-based app, mostly, for most Correct. of its life. And now we're moving to the cloud being consumed in a lot of different ways. Uh, some of it is apps, some of it is devices that are hard-coded to cloud services. Um, some, some of it is pushed, some of it is pulled. So at that level, there's a massive amount of transformation that, from a software point of view, pulls the rug from under your feet unless you're on top of it. And it yep. feels like that's the right place to focus on what's changing. Right. I think that's a, really good, that's a really good point. I had a meeting this week with somebody from Evernote, and I had an interesting discussion with them. I have a sort of love-hate relationship with Evernote. Um, I, I've been using it for a long, long time. I have a lot of data in there. Um, but. Um, sometimes I feel, somebody said to me about a month ago that Evernote was the only Windows app on their iPhone. And, um, and I said, yes, that's exactly, that's how I feel about it sometimes, is Evernote just feels like it is too heavy and it, it's sort of from another era, sort of peeking its head onto these devices. Anyway, this guy I met with, was, we were talking about Evernote and he said increasingly internally they think about Evernote as a cloud-based data store and that uh, they're trying to really enforce this little logical separation in the clients and so that the so that internally and externally they view their clients as just being instances to access that data store and then it just becomes a much more expansive view of what you know what can be done and the possibility and so you know I, I think that's that's what you're talking about right Keith? That's exactly what I'm talking about that it's the cloud as, as data store and messaging bus, actually. I think it's both of those two things, but not necessarily as a place an app runs that's intended to be only consumed through a browser. Okay, so I've got three or two nodding heads here, uh, Robert, but also Kevin, who hasn't said much. I haven't said a word yet, really. Right. Um, well, I, I, do, I, agree, I agree with a, a big chunk of what John's, been, John's saying about open source infrastructure, and I think that's... Um, a key part of, of how, how things are being built today and that's one of the, the great things about having Heroku as part of Salesforce is that we've got a, a gateway to, to build on that stack too and that, that's that's very useful. I spent this weekend at um, Indie Web Camp up in Portland which is independent web developers you know, scratching their own itches trying to build um, their own tools They're run by uh, people like um, Amber Case and Tantec Chilic and yeah. there, there was a bunch of fascinating stuff going on there um, precisely because there was a lot of shared infrastructure, a lot of shared code, um, but also, you know, even though they're not sharing code, they're, they're, they're sharing protocols for how to exchange data back and forth. So a couple of things I saw there. One was um, Brad Fitzpatrick's Camelist store. Um, he did a point two release of that. This is something he's been working on for, for three or four years, which is which is exactly this cloud-based abstract data store idea. But um, instead of being backed in one place, it's, it's designed to replicate between different storage subsystems, but to give you a clean uh, model for accessing data in various forms through it. And it's one of those things that you look at and you go, it's quite hard to understand exactly what it is because it can present in four or five different ways. It can be in a browser, it can be a file system, it can be an API. Um, but the basic idea is you just throw all your stuff into this and then worry about what you do with it later. And I think that, that plays into what um, John, John was saying, which is that um, We've expanded the domain of, of what these different things apply to. Um, there's, there's a domain where a classic relational database makes a lot of sense, but that used to be the, sort of the center of, of the world that you then had lots of acolytes feeding data into it and making it the right shape. Um, and we even went through the whole object relational mapping nightmare of assuming that everything should be stored in a relational database because it, it was such a nice thing. And what we have with these newer stores is you're basically just storing JSON documents or web pages or images or other arbitrary things and, and you, you define a, a, a simple API for moving things back and forth between them. And that's the piece that's... Um, it doesn't make them. It doesn't make the relational database irrelevant, but it it puts it back into its correct domain rather than trying to stretch it to model things that it can't model very well. So like a, a graph database, a social database, is very hard to model with a relational database because all the links feed back to themselves. Whereas with a, a database that's tuned for for holding graphs, you can do a much better job. Um, and similarly, um, if you've got something that is inherently document oriented, trying to parse the documents into something that you can turn into fields is also a very expensive job and not, and not always the best, the best way of doing it and you're better off often just storing the documents and then using 
um, a MapReduce thing like Hadoop to construct the databases as you need them. So, so what, we need it, what, what really we're seeing is a bunch of newer approaches to these thing, to this business of data storage with what the, and, and, and making the tools fit. And the way you integrate them now is you have APIs between them uh, and you define interfaces that you can you can move stuff back and forth. So that, that uh, my sense of a lot of this, this you know, the, the announcement we made was making some of that stuff concrete. There's, there's still value for the relational database as the core, as the core business structures, but making sure that you can move stuff back and forth between them and into these newer stores is going to get more important over time. Well, I understood that last part, but we need somebody <laughs> like Kevin Marks to explain uh, the middle of that uh, <laughs> sermon because uh, you lost me completely. Mm -hmm. uh, well, well let, maybe Borthwick can interpret it for you. He's yeah, no, I'm just I'm teasing <laughs> a little bit, but I want to get this, uh, I, you know, with John here on the show, uh, it'd be nice if we could uh, uh, delve a little bit into what's going on with uh, with uh, Dig and, and, and Reader since uh, you just launched that product, uh, which obviously has had an opportunity. Steve, yes, go ahead. Steve, you're trying really hard not to say RSS, aren't you? No, no, I, I love RSS. I, you know, it, it started everything. I mean, so, just um, because, uh, you know, I just would hope that now that, uh, you know, that Dave Weiner would declare victory and start uh, developing again. Well, uh, he's, he's working on it. I know he is. I know he is. But, outliner. You know, it, you know he's, he's responsible for so much uh, that, that has occurred. And, and so are the, the Twitter guys and, you know, Facebook and all of the social environments that uh, Keith has joined and that you're doing. That's why I want to get back a, a little bit just to, I mean, it's, it's amazing to me that we uh, have been so far talking only about the enterprise space, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about this intersection between enterprise and, and uh, I, I, I've got a good consumers. I've got something there, Steve. I, I was in a meeting the other night uh, listening to startups pitch, and this one startup was pitching um, the complexities in the enterprise created by the fact that there are multiple um, places that human beings' records are stored, and the need in an enterprise to know which record to look at, for example, to get the right phone number for a person, which one is the most up-to-date, which, which is the truth. And we got talking about um, in the era of mobile, where a person owns their own record on their phone, making it possible that the truth is on your device and that the cloud just represents a place that you put the truth for distribution reasons. And that got to a whole discussion around this, the relationship between um, the individual, uh, the bring your own device world that we live in, and corporate data and validation. And it felt as if we are starting to get to a point where the Active Directory service, the centralized Microsoft style Active Directory service or the, um, uh, the LDAP service that uh, non-Microsoft shops usually have uh, in the enterprise has some relationship to the individual's device where the center of the truth reside on the device not in the centralized database. And that to me was the first time I heard a conversation where the architecture of the enterprise began to be impacted by the reality. Uh, and I don't know how real it is, but it sounds very logical. I heard about uh, a third of the last sentence. The reality of, and then I didn't hear. Uh, I, I said, I'm not sure how real this is, but it sounds very logical. And if it, if it is logical, it means that the architecture of software in the enterprise changes from being centralized truth pushed to devices uh, into device truth pushed to centralized copies, which is kind of interesting because then you change your phone number on your device and everyone gets it, but there's no synchronization going on. It's all messages being pushed. Well, I think we've talked a lot on the show about the uh, coming push notification uh, as the central truth of how we consume data that is coming in. Uh, whatever first hits your eye uh, becomes, you know, a large portion of what you actually consume, uh, <clears throat> and it, that I think is already. Sorry, I've been coughing. Uh, that o that's already overturned. I think a, a number of the strategies, uh, such as 
uh, you know, the impact or the relevance of email as the beginning of the day and the end of the day. It's now a, you know, a number of competing streams, uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, social uh, in general. And then, uh, you know, the corporate uh, enterprise messaging infrastructure is also, uh, a, you know, shifting to accommodate these new uh, protocols and new uh, transports and the mobile equation. Robert Scoble, what do you think about uh, uh, the role of mobile in this uh, you know, separated from your, you know, Internet of Things kind of uh, uh, focus these days with that thing on your head. But <laughs> Well, it's, to me, it's not just about the phone number, which, by the way, Facebook is generally the most reliable place to get your uh, a person's phone number because we're all self-interested and we always update our Facebook first, then our LinkedIn. Particularly if we're looking for a job, we keep our LinkedIn up to date. And then... Uh, uh, email is up to date, but but uh, not in a centralized way. I you know I, I look at my email, uh, my phone number inside LDAP inside Rackspace, and it's not accurate because they give me a desk phone number in Texas. I'm never I'm never in Texas, and I don't even know what that phone number is. So if somebody tries calling that, they're gonna get nothing. You know, um, now <laughs> the email is accurate, and most people inside big companies now realize the first first way to start a conversation with somebody is not to call them, it's to email them, say, hey, I need help with a problem, and uh, usually take it from there. But um, what what I really want is not just your phone number, but the likelihood that you're going to be there. I, one reason I like Facebook is you have a green icon next to your name. So at least I know you're online, and at least I know that you're on Facebook. Uh, and that means you're probably willing to take a Facebook message or two, right? Right now I'm on Facebook and you can chat with me on Facebook, right? And and I'm on Google Plus and the, Google Plus has a similar thing through the Hangouts I interface. It has a little icon that shows that I'm online. Skype does the same thing, right? Um, what if you could go further and get a signal that, hey, he's in a meeting? Well, Google certainly knows that on the public side and Outlook knows that on the uh, on the inside right because uh, it knows what I what's on my calendar right now that I have a meeting sc scheduled for Gilmore gang and I'm not likely to take a phone call right now um, and, and so on and so forth so we're heading into an age of context where these systems are going to start snapping together the data and that's why I was interested in the technology that Kevin was seeing at the indie web conference because it's it's that kind of protocol technology that's going to enable developers to snap together more things uh, quicker. That's going to make this glass do something more than just take cool pictures, right? Yeah, I don't think this think is a, a go ahead. No, I think that, that's it. I think the part of the the value is it is now easier to make things that connect to other things. Um, it's easier to stick something up on a, a server in the cloud, call other servers in, in the cloud, and do stuff back and forth. But also, it's getting easier to, as Keith says, have the, have a something in your in your hand that can then talk to that thing as well and can do maybe do some more specialized things locally and send stuff up remotely um, but but both ends of that become valuable and it's 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 I had a session at food camp a couple of years ago which was the pocket versus the cloud which one matters more um, and what we're starting to see is a lot of these data stores and databases have an assumption that I'm operating on some s subset of the database that I happen to have here but potentially that stuff will replicate somewhere else, and that may cause something else to happen too. And working, uh, there's lots of variants of that, and not all of them are, are you know, ideal yet. Um, but, but we're starting to see um, the API for the programmer not, not, not making you know which which one you're talking to, and that that starts to get more interesting. The way, the way I conceptualize that for myself is I think about um, where the center of gravity is. And it's unquestionable that even up to a two years ago, the center of gravity was the cloud. It's now becoming the case some of the time that the center of gravity is the device and that the cloud is a support network to it. And for a lot of things, it's somewhere in the middle. Uh, but the, insofar as there's a shift, it's towards the device. And, and, I, and I don't know what that means specifically because it's very specific to each each uh, thing. But, yeah, uh, in an hour, the guy who invented Sherpa is going to be here. Sherpa is an uh, Android competitor to Siri. Um, 
but that's exactly what he's doing. He's using the cloud to find things and centralize it somewhat on, on your device so it, it gives faster answers and better answers and better context of what you're talking to it about. Um, John Barthwick, what do you think? Go ahead. Um, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if this concept of the phone as truth. I mean, I, I, I think truth is a, I think it's, it's going to be a little bit more distributed. There's a lot of background noise. Is that me? Uh, it's, it's, it's the, it's called life. There's life. Just, yeah. Just so, in, yeah, so, sort of like truth. It, it, it's, it is, um, I mean, I think that the you know the phone the phone like the cloud. I think he gets a sort of edited subset of data um, that you know maybe more representational itself because it's a more personal object. But I think it's still a sort of edited subset. So I'm not sure I, I, I I'm not sure I see it quite that way. What I see is that uh, I, I think Robert alluded to it a little bit is that. You know, it's not so much the real-time aspects of it as the uh, once you realize and understand intuitively that you're in an environment where there are constant updates, there's constant movement, there's constant change, that you then need to uh, basically uh, make sure that if something happens, that if you're not immediately notified about it or if you're not alert to it, uh, for whatever reason you're busy, whatever, that you have a quick way of being able to retrieve it. Uh, that there's a sort of secondary filtering mechanism which will prioritize what has been coming in while you've been away, whether it's just uh, away in terms of your focus and attention or physically you know, not taking messages. And that assumption, I think, is one of the drivers behind a lot of the uh, <clears throat> activity around file sync and you know box Dropbox, uh, you know, and the various uh, uh, solutions for transporting uh, your documents on the network so that they are available to you when you need them. Uh, so, in other words, is uh, what Kevin was saying is that it really isn't either or. It's not uh, mobile or cloud. It's both not just one central central location of truth but a set of different places where you where you place things so one of the concepts from the um, indie web is what they call posse publish on your own site syndicate elsewhere which is the way of saying I generate a lot of stuff I want to make sure that I've got a copy of it all because um, at least then I know it's mine and then I can send it out to Twitter or Facebook or any of the other you know, any of these possible places you know there's two or three new ones each day um, and they may be ephemeral, and it may be worth sending some va some parts of it to that, and keeping some parts of it elsewhere. And we've seen that, you know, one of one of the great successes of Instagram was that they made that um, work very well. You keep all the all the ones you take in Instagram itself, but they you they would send them out to to Facebook and Twitter, um, and, and and so on, and let you propagate bits of bits of this to different places. And I think that's going to get more make more sense over time as we start having more of these fora that make sense for different places. So there's some stuff I'd send to, to Twitter, there's some stuff I'd send to Chatter for the internal consumption, there's some stuff I'd send to Facebook because that's where my, my family's hanging out, um, and there's some stuff I'd, I'd say for writing my long blog post um, and then decide where I, where I, who else would benefit from seeing that. Um, and not assuming that there is one source of truth, but there are overlapping sources of, of truth and knowledge and interest, um, and that stuff can move between them is, is getting to be part of this as well. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, uh, having Google Now, you have Google Now now on a, on a iOS and, and Android, and it does stuff like if you walk into an airport, it pops up uh, your plane tickets and your uh, gate number and whether you're uh, whether your plane's on time and stuff like that and it's really cool on glass when you walk into an airport and it's there but uh, one time I was coming back from Amsterdam and it was wrong because 20 minutes before I had called and switched my flight and it, it wasn't picking up the truth right it was picking up the truth of 20 minutes ago but not the current truth and uh, these systems need to better snap together and need to be correctable by the user. And right, right. now, I can't, I can't correct uh, Google now and say no, I'm not on UA 
593, I'm on UA 894, you know? And I, I, well, what, what you're saying, Robert, is that the truth, there are degrees of importance of truth, and, and, and there are some things that lend themselves to the user owning the truth, for example, your name, address, phone number, social security number, blah, blah, email address. There are some pieces of data where somebody else should own the truth. In your case, it's probably the airline. and the air, uh, So, so I, I think the truth is um, relative to who the... It's, it's not always one airline is the problem. But yeah. if, you look, if you look at something specific like uh, user profiles, um, in the past you could say that Facebook was going to be the truth or that LinkedIn was the truth for another person, depending on which service they most preferred. But what I'm saying is that it's actually possible now to envisage the truth coming not from a service provider, but from the individual themselves. Well, and, that, right. and that's how Google Now works, right? Google Now assumes the truth is inside your email, though. And, and the, when I changed that flight, United didn't uh, email me a corrected itinerary. So Google Now didn't know that there was a new truth available <laughs> somewhere in the world. So it still needs to ask the user, hey, is there a different version of truth for, right. for the I system? Think also, Robert, I had a similar example this week where with Tempo, um, it, uh, I had a conference call and it believes that the conference call was actually a location. So every time the number in the, uh, in the item. So it had the wrong structured data types every time I hit uh, dial, it would actually try to pull up Google Maps. Yeah, <laughs> and, so, and so you know, user modifiable, but also understanding how these categories um, uh, and the metadata is led on top, hugely important, right? Now the problem is, John. Uh, you know, at Google, they're they're uh, taking on a philosophy that everything should be automatic. Because uh, yeah. I, I asked Steve Lee, who runs, uh, the, who's a product manager on the Glass team. Why don't you give me more settings like that? And he goes, so we don't, we have a philosophy that we don't have any settings. We don't have any, uh, we're trying to make the world automatic. And it's cool when it works. Like uh, Francine and I were talking in the chat room about photos. When you, when this thing automatically uploads photos, so it's automatic there, uh, it automatically picks the most interesting ones and uh, using algorithms to figure out what, what are more, most likely to be the most interesting photos, which is, you know, it's interesting that it can try to do that, and it's pretty good at at it actually. Right. And then it, it automatically adjusts the photos like a Photoshop editor would to make the color and the sharpness and the and the depth better. And it does a pretty good job of that too. But but uh, this philosophy that the world is going to be automatic and and that it's Apple almost like Robert. It's almost like when we um, you know when Windows sort of became a. Um, a navigational metaphor and a layer, you know, obscuring the command line. Um, uh, we, you know, we suddenly had a GUI which was our navigational um, interface, and now it's almost like we're having an algorithmic GUI that's being led on top of computing. And that's clever, yeah, I like and, that. And um, you know, Kevin Slavin has a brilliant TED talk which he does about this, where which is sort of related to it, but where he talks about. A lot of different things, but he uses the analogy of some, you know, these elevators you get into, and they tell you which floor you program the floor downstairs. Yeah, and you know there is only one button you can hit, and the button is stop, right? Um, you you can't actually uh, you can't actually modulate the algorithms, and I think that the idea that sort of I remind that there was a piece by Neil Stevenson called "In the Beginning Was the Command Line." And I think that in the same way that we've, you know, abstracted away a lot of computing, which has brought a lot to society, I think that this idea that this algorithmic GUI abstracts away another whole layer of computing is, um, uh, is problematic because I think that it's, uh, it's, it's going to make it very hard for us to, as human beings, interact with a lot of the stuff. Yeah, I mean, I just one of the biggest problems I have with uh, I know uh, Keith, you have to drop, but uh, five, five more. Okay, great. Uh, the thing that I uh, uh, the my problem with Facebook, for example, is not that their services aren't interesting, uh, not that uh, their algorithms aren't uh, uh, useful, is that if I had the alternative 
to those algorithms, I'd be fine. So I think that right, not- right, that's exactly right. It's like I mean, I I remember going to a dinner party about two years ago, and there were a whole bunch of people. It was in New York City, and there were a whole bunch of people there who didn't understand that their Facebook news feed was algorithmically filtered. Right. And one of the reasons why I love Twitter is because I have the raw feed. I have I have uh, the command line is still accessible. Right. I, actually, and, in the new Facebook, it is accessible again. Uh, there's a. Let me look it up just to be accurate. Yeah, uh, we have to wait for you to figure it out and tell us. Google Glass World. Yeah, I think you still got to have the ability just to like access the command line, and so you know this entirely constructed with uh, McFlew. I think is there, um, there. I'm gonna really disagree with you. <laughs> uh, the Google Glass, the Twitter app, uh, shows me tweets from people that I've set to. Uh, turn on their mobile notifications, and I've done that for about uh, 20 people. I think Steve Gilmore's one of them, Danny's one, and then I, I have TechCrunch and GigaOM and ReadWriteWeb yeah. and NextWeb. Those, just those 20 people are putting a new tweet in in my uh, head every 30 seconds or so, and it, it doesn't turn on the projector, so it doesn't distract me, but it chimes, and I know that they're there, and then I can turn it on and read tweets. You know, here's one from Jeremiah, here's one from Dave Weiner, here's one from the Daily Dot. Um, you right, know, but and you, on you're and controlling on. that, right? That's what I mean by access. Yes. Yeah, right. but right, uh, but I control it not in the glass, but on the desktop where I set uh, who gets Fine. to. Be notification, but if you sent me all forty thousand people that I was subscribed no, to, no, no, oh, no, God, no, 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 no. But I, you know, it's having control of it. You don't need control of it on that device. Yeah. Yes. Go, go back to the abstract point about the algorithms and the ac- actionability of data and so on. Um, I, we, I had a great example today where we had an Archimedes Labs meeting this morning, and three people showed up late because there was an accident on the one hundred and one near Embarcadero, and. The company that was coming to see us was a company in the traffic information space uh, who was pitching to us. And this company has developed an algorithm that can time a delay and do it in real time uh, better than, say, a Waze can. Uh, it's, got, it's got a predictive algorithm that takes into account lots of variables, including events on and all kinds of stuff. But and nothing that we have today, even how great we've got in the cloud and how great the predictability is and how good the algorithms are, there was nothing anyone could have used this morning other than manually to figure out that they were going to be late for the meeting. So there's a lot of innovation still to be done between the cloud and the device and the person as to not just what is the truth. Uh, I mean, I can look at a Google map and see a red line, but I don't know what that means in terms of how late I'm going to be. I just know I'm going to be late. Uh, There's a lot of space to get between the user, the data, the cloud, and the device. Even Google now, in a way, doesn't do it because it isn't pushed at you. You've got to go and look. It's more more, the notification center feels more like the right place than Google now. Uh, And and the ability to what John called uh, algorithmic GUIs, was it? It, 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 I, th- I liked what, I, what it was, I've forgotten the exact words. Basically, the ability to understand and inform you when you need to know about something that's going to impact you. We don't really have that yet. And Robert talks about contextual computing a lot, which I think is the right way to frame the goal. We're a long way away from, yeah. from it. No, I, I, uh, you know, I want to talk to the internet and just ask it questions. Where's the closest sh- coffee shop, or, you know, what's uh, what's playing at at the movie theater tonight, or you know, all sorts of things. And it's it's not even close to satisfying that expectation. Um, it's giving us a little tiny taste. It's like <laughs> Google just gave me a little taste of what the future is going to be like, and uh, the future still is you know four, five, six, seven, twenty years away, right? I don't agree with that at all. Uh, I mean, well, uh, it's I, not four here or five, yet. six months away. I don't. I, you know, we always underestimate Maximum. how long it takes to c- do this stuff right. <laughs> uh, I didn't say that it has to be done right, but the future is is not just. Uh, thanks, Keith. We'll see you again next time. Thanks, yeah. Keith. Uh, the future is is not just people doing something right. It's also. Uh, a lot of people doing something where they're experimenting, where they're, you know, we oh, stumble that. into the future. We don't just, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it's not. And we iterate into it. So it's great that I have a little taste 
and next next month I'll have a little bit better taste. And then the why is know. that? What's happening next uh, month? Because the app developers, I just got a Gmail from an app developer that built another app for the glass, so that the app developers are starting to dream and build and and iterate. And then people that Ke Kevin was talking with are building new protocols to let these things snap together better. And and it all gets better, and some of it doesn't work, and some of it does. So uh, uh, that's why one. we have the Gilmore Gang every Friday, right? <laughs> so we have something to talk about. Well, and thank God, about. right? <laughs> uh, so we're going to wind down a little bit here, and uh, so I want to start with uh, John Borthwick and ask you, uh, what what do you think is uh, going to be interesting that's coming up in the next few weeks? I mean, you know, it's the July Fourth, things are going to slow down, but uh, I have a feeling, I and mean, given the uh, the volume and the uh, importance of things that went on this week, uh, that uh, things uh, things are really moving right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's an awful there's an awful lot going on. So, I mean, you know, we're I I've been pretty distracted lot the, in the past week with the dig um, with the dig launch, yeah. and so and you um, still haven't answered me. How's that going? What's going? It's on? going. It's it's going great. You know, I'll give you a quick answer. I wanted to talk about other stuff, but it it's going great. I mean, we are um, with we we signed up and brought in about a hundred thousand people into the the new reader, uh, and what we're doing is we are. We want it to be really fast and really stable, and the back end of this stuff sort of it sort of forks off the discussion we were having earlier about systems. Uh, the back end is uh, it's complicated, and you know we have a couple of million, I think about three three and a half million feeds that are going through the system now, and that's you know about two million more than yesterday, and so you know we're adding the feeds at a tired rate, and so we're just metering it through and going slowly because when we take it off and make it open uh, to everyone publicly on the web. We want it to work really well. Mm -hmm. uh, now that said, as, as a lot of users have, have, have uh, figured out, you can download the iOS app and get running on it uh, straight on iOS. There's always like, you know, launching web and iOS together is always uh, tricky. And so since, you know, once we had pushed about 25, 30,000 people onto the web app, we just pushed the iOS app out. And so you could just get on the iOS app and then sync in with Google and you're off and running. Um, it is, um, so it's going really well. It is a, um, it, it has been remarkable the amount of attention and, and interest that has been in a reader product in 2013. I thought this was a very important part of the system um, that we were building at Betaworks. And um, Andrew and the team have done a, uh, have done a great job of delivering you know, in typical Betaworks fashion, a very you know, highly functional product that you know, gets out of the way and lets you do what you need to do. Um, but I've been surprised by the amount of attention to it. All right, so you, you, were, you wanted Johnny, to talk about some other things. Johnny, you plan to produce a, um, an API that's, that's the equivalent of what Reader would um, had as what an Reader official had? API? Yeah, so, we want to do stuff on the API stuff. We want to do market, uh, you know, um, uh, we w there's a whole bunch of functionality which we know has got to come, uh, but we do want to do an API. Because be um, part of the value was the centralized crawling, um, and if you yeah. if you are crawling several million feeds, that's better than each of us doing it individually for our own machines. So I, I agree. You know, hooking to I that agree. would be great. Yeah. It, yeah. So there will be some of that will come, and you know we've got wonderful partner companies. I mean, within the BetaWorks network, a company we invested in is is If This Then That, who we love, and yes. you know we'll work with those guys and do some fun stuff. The other thing I should mention is is that, you know, also at Betaworks, I mean, the attention this week is much of it's been on uh, on on Dig and what we're doing there, but we also have this wonderful other company that is the leader in the fashion blogging space, and Blog Loving. It's a it's a RSS aggregator for fashion blogs, and Blog Loving has since you know the RS, the the reader announcement, the Google reader announcement, Blog Loving has picked up a couple of million users. And so it's more than five. It's uh, on Uniques. I think we're going to be more than six this month. And so uh, blog loving is doing great. It's a very different audience. It's 90% women. And the word RSS and reader are sort of nowhere on that product. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, but it's, again, you know, a testament to the fact that we, we view this as a really important piece of the system, right? So there's data which we see on the Bitly side. There's data which we're seeing on the reader side. And there's uh, wonderful tools like Insta, like Instapaper, which uh, which we're now building out, which you know all fit into this puzzle 
um, of the emerging sort of uh, news reading curation uh, discovery system. What, why hasn't there been a uh, winner take all in in the news aggregator business? I'm not, I mean, even on my own behavior, I, I really like Flipboard, but I still use Prismatic. I still use Pulse. Um, you know, and we have lots of arguments. And other people say they hate Flipboard and they love Pulse or they love Zeit. And other people say they hate all those and they love Dig. It's, it's I, a very personal thing, I, I think. think. It is, it's, yeah. How these present themselves is very personal. This is why I was yeah, asking about APIs. Because th be. there's value yeah. in that back end infrastructure and making, you know, has this thing updated? Have I read it already? Storing that in a, in a useful way. But then there's I lots of ways of presenting that, that that are enormously valuable. And a bunch of those, you know, what happened was effectively Google produce that API because it's very hard to compete with their level of crawl. Um, and so we had these competing things that were based on not how things were crawled, but on how they were presented. I think we're going right. to get that, that back again thing. So right. is that I, would, I would add to that that I think that there's you know, a key piece of the, um, of the stickiness to um, certain apps is the integration of the, of the social graph with the, um, with, with the data and with the interest graph. And now we've had, you know, now we've got social graphs that are scale and that are independent. You could flip back and forth between these things. So, you know, put in English is that your, your friend graph is not necessarily fully embedded in these things. So these things are much more switchable, which I think is a good thing. I think that these are very personal things. They depend on workflow. They also depend on devices, you know. I think the Flipboard guys are doing a really nice job on, you know, uh, on a device. And um, on the mobile device, and yeah. so you know, I think that um, we'll see if that, that expertise translates to the web because I I know they're working on a web, and they just announced Windows 8 uh, versions yesterday, yeah. I think, right? Yeah. So, so we'll see. I mean, we'll see, but it's uh, you know, I think so. I don't think it's a I I don't think that this is a there's no there's no evident uh, network effect in the you know if I use it and you use it that it makes it better, right? Um, well, and, except for the, mag the, play, the magazines, the magazines are yeah, the playlist you, magazines. Yeah, the, the the Flipboard magazines are uh, what got me back into Flipboard. I I started using Prismatic and other services more for a while because they were better at algorithmically picking. But the magazines are because they're human done. There's something to that, and then if if there's a com combined algorithmic and human approach to it, that, then I think you could see. Uh, a network effect, but it's it's a hard one to communicate. Um, yeah, well, I'm look, seeing it because I'm building magazines. But it, like my dad, I I'm not so sure he would get it, you know. And, yeah. and it's hard to com communicate even to, to somebody like Francine is extraordinarily smart and and connected. What's powerful about that? Right, and we have you know both in Dig and Blog Loving, we have those editorial aspects to them. Right, in Blog Loving, it's mostly done by the bloggers. But in Dig, you know, the top of Dig is, you know, the way it's the way it works now is you've got a top which is, you know, Dig.com, which is what the internet is talking about right now, which is data filtered by editors, right? So that's human driven. You then have your RSS, which is entirely personal, and then we have a wonderful little popular feature which sifts your RSS and algorithmically gives you the stuff that's most interesting and popular right now within your selected RSS. And so we sort of viewed it as, you know, these three different tiers. And um, I think that it's, you know, some combination like that feels right. And so, but we are, you know, we're, we're learning. Um, there's the back end stuff here is, uh, is challenging. As Kevin said, you know, it's, um, I, I hope everybody doesn't have to do it. It's, um, uh, it's, there's a lot of scaling and a lot of data that we're dealing with. And, um, uh, we're having fun with it, but we're, we want to get it right, and you know we'll have it open uh, for people who want access. Go straight to the you know, iOS app, um, or go to the website. And if you just sign up on the website, you know we, we're giving access pretty fast now. So we're we're close to being able to uh, open it up fully, but uh, we want to do it right um, and not rush it. And so we've you know got a lot going on there, um, and um, and then also. Uh, you know, for the um, for the women who on uh, who on the show, take a look at Blog Lobby because it's a wonderful product. Well, the, the <laughs> one of the things that I think is uh, sort of unspoken in your strategy regarding 
uh, you know, web versus or in addition to uh, iOS. It's really turned around. It's it, although you started with web, you actually uh, built the web enough so that you could get some flow going, and then you went to what is in fact uh, the reference platform, which is iOS. Correct. Yeah. So I think that's uh, the kind of thing that we're starting to see is. Uh, and as I've been saying ad nauseum for a long time, uh, the push notification uh, environment uh, becomes the great leveler and how people tune their output in notifications uh, to, you know, credibly not overwhelm other sources that are valuable to people is going to be where uh, yeah. the rubber meets the road. So. Uh, that that is underway now. I think uh, just sort of the way that they start the Indianapolis 500 with everybody sort of going like this and swerving uh, to try and get uh, a foot and a half advantage at the start. I think that's where we are right now in terms of uh, notifications. Thoughts? Uh, I, I All right. All right. What's coming up for you uh, in the next few weeks, Robert? Do you see anything on the horizon? Um, hmm. Um, no, not 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 really. I, we're trying to finish off the book. Um, I'm start. I'm continuing to see interesting, interesting things. I mean, this week I was at uh, a start conference uh, run by Patty uh, in San Francisco, and uh, saw saw, saw uh, I interviewed a 3D printing company again, and that's that space is continue to intrigue me and I think getting more and more important. Didn't Brie Pettis' uh, company just sell out and MakerBot? Yeah. This whole, so yeah, massive. Yeah, big exit there. You know, $600 million or something like that. Um, yeah. And uh, robots continue to be interesting. We talked about that at a conference. And then yesterday I was at an education conference and the stuff I'm seeing for teachers is really starting to become interesting. Uh, because tablets are, you know, iPads are coming down in cost, and more and more teachers are getting those. And they they were passing along a tablet that's going to sell for fifty dollars, that um, um, uh, that the uh, Esther was 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 I can't even say her last name, but she's teacher of the year in Palo Alto High, and she's giving them to her kids, and her kids are using them with other kids in India. So think about what a fifty-dollar tablet, which is an Android tablet, sort of looks like a a low-quality Nexus Seven. But think about how that's going to change education around the world and and uh, open up all sorts of new opportunities for for uh, um, startups. And I think that's why the the VC community is getting a little bit hot and bothered by education, which they haven't been for a decade or so. Uh, Kevin, uh, thoughts? Um. Um, I'm well. What's coming up for me is I'm going to England for for next week, so I'll be aw I'll be away. Um, I think there's the, the, the what I what I took away from the indie web camp was that, that it's exciting again to be building all these bits and pieces. Um, mm -hmm. And there, there was a lot of energy there about um, building things that um, didn't have to integrate with um, any particular silo, and that that was that was very fascinating. All right, uh, so. Uh, I think we're all going to be going away uh, over the next uh, few days. Uh, for the, this is an interesting holiday. But there's so much uh, work that needs to be done uh, that we all need a little bit of a break in order to be able to uh, recharge our batteries. So I think we, uh, it's possible that we'll do something uh, next week, but it's more likely that we won't. Uh, I want to thank. Uh, Rackspace and particularly Rob Lejess, uh for and there's there's what does that say? Rackspace. Thank you <laughs> uh, for making the show uh, uh, reappear in the. Uh, I, it actually, you know, in the chat room, uh, Francine just got glass this week. It'd be fun to have her on the show talking about where she thinks this is going. And uh, I also want to thank. Uh, uh, New Tech on their TriCaster. I want to thank our producer and director, Tina Chase Gilmore. That's her fingers right there. And uh, I want to thank uh, the uh, now absent Keith Tier. 
Thanks, Keith. I want to thank uh, Kevin Marks. Thank I want, you. I want to thank Robert Scoble. And I want to thank the ubiquitous John Borthwick. Thanks for uh, making Thanks, time. Thanks, Steve. We appreciate it, knowing thank how you, uh, busy New York can be. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Larry Ellison for uh, inspiring us. I never thought I'd say that, but I think it's true. He's, <laughs> he's really said some very interesting things on uh, in that call. And, of course, Mark Benioff for uh, leading the way. Uh, th every, thanks to everybody who showed up, and especially those who didn't. We'll see you again, uh, you know, a little bit later than next time. Bye-bye. Bye, Steve. Thank you. Thank you.